What's going on everybody? I'm Johnny Brook and welcome back to another Crafty Workshop video. This week's video, I'm gonna show you how I built this really simple but super functional outfeed table. It's got a ton of dog holes for work holding and then a ton of storage here down below and it's all mobile so it's easy to move around the shop. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the project. So as I mentioned in my shop tour video, I decided to move my T-Track assembly table down by the workbench, which I think makes more sense in the workflow of my shop. But that said, with the assembly table down there, I was left with no outfeed table for the table saw. So I decided to whip up a quick table with some pretty cool features. So I wanted to avoid purchasing as much material as possible for this project. And shop projects are one of my favorite ways to use up those scraps of plywood that you've been hanging on to for way too long. So before moving on, let's hop into SketchUp real quick and I'll show you how the design of this table works. So this design is based on a video that Mark from The Wood Whisperer published a few years ago, but I guess his video was based on a design from our hero, the OG video woodworker, Norm from The New Yankee Workshop. The design is incredibly simple, but also super sturdy. The legs are made up of two pieces of plywood joined at 90 degrees, and then the stretchers are attached in the inside corners of the legs. And all of the stretchers overlap, which creates an incredibly strong joint with tons of glue surface. And I'll have this SketchUp model available for free on my website if you want to download it, but I won't be selling plans since this isn't my original design. Back to the build, I kept ripping strips of plywood for the stretchers and legs, using up all those random scraps, and then I could cut the top to size from the one full sheet of plywood I already had on hand. And I ripped it to width at the table saw and then cross cut it to length with the track saw, making sure to cut off that factory edge to get a nice clean glue line between the edge of the plywood top and the trim I would be adding later. To cut the legs and stretchers to length, it was back to the table saw. And I used the crosscut table here, but a crosscut sled or miter saw would also work really great, and preferably something with a stop block, as keeping these parts the same length is pretty important to make sure everything goes together nice and square. For the trim for the top, I pulled down this piece of rough poplar I've had hanging around the shop since I built that changing table over a year ago, and it ended up being the perfect size for this. I ripped the piece into strips over the bandsaw, which is much safer than trying to rip rough lumber at the table saw, and also waste less wood since the kerf on the bandsaw is much smaller. After ripping the board into strips, I took the strips to the jointer and squared up one face and one edge. Now I'm doing all this because I already had this piece of lumber on hand, but you could just as easily buy a poplar 1x2 and skip all of this milling. This is an extremely simple project and you could easily build the entire thing with a table saw or even circular saw and a drill, so I don't want to hear any complaints about not having the tools. So once the boards had one square face and one square edge, I moved over to my sweet new 20 inch Powermatic planer and got the boards down to their final thickness of three quarters of an inch. Finally, I ripped the boards to their final width of about an inch and a quarter at the table saw, and then I could get the trim pieces attached to the top. I used glue and inch and a half brad nails for this and left the strips extra long so that I could cut them flush after the glue dried. And speaking of which, I cut the strips to final length with my Japanese pull saw, and then cleaned up any roughness with my block plane. And as you can see, I added the trim to the ends first, trimmed them flush, and then added the trim to the front and back. And this leaves you with a really nice clean corner without having to mess around with mitering the corners. With the trim attached, I could get to work on the base. And first I needed to build the legs, which I assembled using glue and brad nails, and then reinforced them with screws. On these leg pieces, there's one wider piece and one narrow piece, and these pieces need to be oriented so that the edge of the narrow piece is being attached to the face of the wide piece, so that the legs will have a matching measurement on both faces, if, if that makes sense. Basically, we're trying to make the legs look like 4x4s, essentially. I did mark my hole locations here since I was going to be plugging these holes and wanted them to have a nice clean look. And I used this countersink bit from Rockler, which has a stop collar, which allowed me to countersink the holes to a consistent depth. Once the legs were attached, I could add pocket holes to the top edge of the stretchers before attaching them to the legs. And these holes will be used to attach the top to the base so that there aren't any exposed screw heads on the top. And I should have also added pocket holes to the lower stretchers, but I just didn't really think about it. Before assembling the base, I measured the height of my table saw dust port just to make sure the lower stretchers cleared it, and then I could get to assembly. So first I attached the sides of the table, attaching the shorter stretchers to the legs, 
and I made sure to orient the legs so that the wider faces were facing the front and back of the base, or at least I did this on the first assembly before mixing it up on the second assembly. I attached the stretchers with glue and brad nails and then reinforced them with inch and a quarter screws. Also, I get a ton of questions about the screws I use and these inch and a quarter screws with a square head are one of my favorites. They drive really easily, they look good, and best of all, they're not Phillips head, which I avoid like the plague. And again, I'll link to them in the description below. After assembling the sides, I could get the base finished by attaching the long stretchers to the sides. And once again, I used glue, brad nails, and screws, and also made sure everything was square with a large speed square. Once that was assembled, I could get the last pieces attached to the base, which were the center supports. And these help to support the top and bottom shelves and also provide some more structure to keep the longer stretchers from bowing out. I cut the board to length over the table saw, added pocket holes to the top edge as well as the ends, then clamped the board in place after marking the center point of the long stretcher. And looking back at this footage, I actually clamped the board right over one of the pocket holes in the long stretchers, so I'd recommend not doing this as that is probably a pretty weak connection. I added two supports for the bottom shelf off camera and then cut some mounting blocks for the casters. And these blocks attach to the bottom of the legs and provide just a little bit more support for the casters and also set the outfeed table at the correct height to match the table saw. I attached the blocks with brad nails and then added some casters with some fast cap powerhead screws, which are another one of my favorite screws by the way. The large head is really perfect for attaching things like casters. Next, I could get the screw holes on the legs plugged, and I decided to get a little bit fancy like Mark did in his video and use a walnut dowel for this. I cut the plugs to length at the bandsaw, and one of my favorite features of this bandsaw is the brake, which allows you to stop the blade quickly so that you can safely grab the pieces you've just cut. I added glue to each of the plugs and then drove them in with this gorgeous hammer from my buddy Zach at ZH Fabrications, which I'm almost afraid to use because it's so dang nice. After letting the glue dry for a bit, I pulled out my Japanese pull saw again to flush up the plugs. I like to add a piece of painter's tape where I'm going to be placing the saw, and this just helps to keep the saw's teeth from digging into your workpiece. And this is especially important on plywood like this with a really thin veneer, as it's super easy to eat through that veneer. Once all the plugs were flushed up, I came back and sanded down the whole outfit table, getting all the plugs nice and even, and also breaking the bottom edges of the top stretchers. And while I'm sanding, let's talk about the sponsor of this week's video, Powermatic, the gold standard. So as you guys know, I've added a bunch of Powermatic tools to my shop over the past few years, and they have really been total game changers for my woodworking. The added power of the bandsaw, the extra width and gorgeous surface finish from the planer, and the precision of the drum sander, just to name a few, have been absolutely amazing, and I know these tools will last me for many, many years to come. So to learn more about these machines and why I love them so much, check out the links in the video description below and thanks to Powermatic for sponsoring this week's video and supporting what I do. Once I was done sanding, I could set the top on the base and do a quick test fit over the table saw just to make sure everything fit together nicely. And unfortunately, it didn't. So somehow I had done my math wrong and the top of the outfeed table was sitting about an eighth of an inch above the top of the table saw, which was an easy enough fix just by swapping the three quarter inch plywood mounting blocks for half inch plywood blocks. Another issue I ran into was some interference between the overarm dust collection pipe and the trim pieces, which hung lower than the top. So to fix this, I marked where the interference was and then went back to the assembly table and pulled out some hand tools. So I started by establishing a square cut where I wanted the cutout to end using the Japanese pull saw and my Cat's Moses dovetail jig as a guide. Next, I used a chisel to cut away the excess material facing the bevel towards the piece to allow me to control the cut a little bit better and just kept removing material until I had an area wide enough to get my pull saw into. Once I could get my saw into the space, I could move much quicker and saw away the excess, making sure I was using the rip teeth on the saw instead of the crosscut teeth. And I removed some of the waste about halfway through the cut as it was creating a lot of drag on the saw and then just finished up the cut. So with the bulk of the material removed, I cleaned up the cut with my block plane and let me tell you, poplar planes like a dream. So I finished everything off with a little bit of sanding just to break the edges and the cutout was done. I went back for another test fit and now the height of the table was spot on about an eighth of an inch below the surface of the table saw and the cutout section allowed the top to fit over the dust collection pipe perfectly. 
The next step was to route some channels to allow any jigs that have miter bars to move freely through where the outfeed table is located. So I marked the rough locations of the two miter slots, marked out some lines to indicate where I wanted to cut the miter slots in the outfeed table, then whipped up a quick jig to route the slots. I cut the slots oversized so I wouldn't have to worry about precise alignment of the table, and I just assembled this jig with a little bit of CA glue. To cut the slot, I installed this Infinity Tools template bit in my router and then attached the jig to the tabletop with some double-sided tape. I set my depth stop off camera, so I lowered the router to the depth stop and then routed out the slot. And unfortunately, I used way more tape than I needed, so pulling the jig off of the table was a little bit difficult and I ended up ripping the jig apart, but luckily it was really easy to reassemble with a little bit more CA glue and then I could route the second slot. And this is probably a better angle of this process. You just wanna make sure you're plunging deep enough so that the bearing on the bit is riding on your jig. Otherwise, you'll be routing freehand and cutting into your jig. You also wanna make sure to run your router clockwise along the jig when making a cut like this. After removing the jig, I cleaned things up with the sanding block and then I could move on to getting the bottom shelf installed. So first I measured for the piece and cut it to size over the table saw. And due to the design of this base, the bottom piece had to be broken into two pieces. I did have to buy one piece of plywood just for the shelf, and I ended up picking up a 5x5 sheet of half inch Baltic birch, which was the perfect size. I cut the piece to size of the table saw, breaking it into two equally sized pieces, and then dropped the pieces into place on the bottom stretchers. And because I forgot to drill pocket holes earlier and just didn't feel like getting out my pocket hole jig, I screwed down the pieces through the top of the shelf. I did remember to add pocket holes to the center supports, so after screwing the panels down, I flipped the base and attached those screws. At the last minute, I decided to add some dog holes to the top after talking to a furniture builder friend of mine, and he uses his dog holes to help support pieces when he's cutting them down with his track saw, and I figured I'd be doing that a lot in this area. To cut the holes, I whipped up a quick template on my X-Carve, and the tabletop was way bigger than the X-Carve, so I couldn't cut it directly on the machine, but by cutting the template with the X-Carve, I could be sure the hole spacing was perfect and I could use the dog holes as square reference points. After the X-Carve cut the first dog hole, I stopped the operation to double check that my dogs would fit well, which they did, so I let the X-Carve cut the rest of the template. I cut the holes with a four inch spacing, which is the same spacing Ron Polk uses on his workbench, and this cut took less than 10 minutes. And I'll have a link to the easel file I created in case you wanna cut a similar template on your X-Carve. My clamps did slip on the final pass on the outline of the cut, so I just stopped the operation and trimmed the excess away of the bandsaw, then flushed everything up with a flush trim bit, also from Infinity Tools, at the router table. To allow the template to reference the corner of the table, I added some strips of plywood to the edges of the template with CA glue, and using a little bit of activator made the CA glue bond pretty much instantly, and I could knock off these strips once I had the first set of holes routed. Speaking of which, next I clamped the jig in place, referencing the front left corner of the top, and then I could get to routing. And you could also use a large drill bit like this one here, which I used to drill the dog holes in my Rubo workbench, but a router leaves a much cleaner hole and my router has a dust collection. I used that same template bit that I used for the miter slots here and made the cuts in two passes. Unfortunately, I ended up nicking a few of the holes in the template just due to me being in a rush, so I did have to avoid those holes, but overall things went really smoothly. On the last row of holes closest to the right edge of the table, which I probably shouldn't have even cut, I ran into some brad nails that held on the trim, so I skipped the rest of those holes until the very end and just continued routing out the rest of the holes. Once I got the rest of the holes routed, I came back to that row next to the trim. I first drilled out the holes with a half inch metal specific drill bit, which took care of any brad nails, and then finished the holes with the router. So with that, the holes were done, and you can see just how cleanly they were cut, even with me taking about half an inch of material on that first pass. So to finish up the holes, I swapped over to a chamfer bit just to lightly chamfer the holes, and this not only allows you to add your bench dogs more easily, but it also keeps the veneer on the plywood from tearing out due to repeated use. And it also just looks really nice. With all the holes cut and chamfered, all that was left to do was apply some finish. So I sprayed on a few coats of water-based polyurethane, which I find lays out a lot nicer if I thin it about 20% with water. And as you can see, I actually decided to add the dog holes after applying the first few coats of finish while thinking about it over the weekend, but either way, I applied three coats of finish in total, sanding the top between coats to make sure it was super smooth. 
Finally, I could get the top attached to the base, which was a simple task with the pocket holes I had drilled earlier. Otherwise, all that was left to do was flip the table back over, which was kind of difficult by myself, and get it set into place. I also got that bottom shelf loaded up, which just so happens to fit my extra sustainers pretty much perfectly. And with that, I could call this outfeed table finished. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. I'm really happy with the way this whole thing came together. Again, I will have a free SketchUp file available for this. Again, I'm not doing plans. It's not my original design or anything, but I will have that free file available on my website. I'll have a link to that in the video description below as well as in the cards. Also linked in the video description below will be all of the tools and materials I used on this project, including all of those sweet, sweet Powermatic tools. And last, if you aren't already, go ahead and get subscribed. I put out new project videos like this pretty much every week and ring that little notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. All right, thanks for watching everybody and until next time happy building